I'm India. And I'm Sophie. Welcome to The Transcript. This week, The Transcript looks into debates in Washington surrounding immigration reform, hits us up with the Northampton High Ski Team, and explores how blackface has evolved over time. On Tuesday, a 6.4 magnitude earthquake hit Taiwan's east coast, killing six people, injuring 225, and leaving 80 missing. The quake hit an area known as the Pacific Ring of Fire, a center of seismic activity from Alaska to Southeast Asia. The earthquake left many buildings caved in and some dangerously tilted. It has left roads buckled and halted electricity and water services for thousands of households. This past Friday and Monday, the stock market plummeted. On Monday, the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 1,175 points, its largest one-day drop in history. Industry analysts believe that a report on wage data released by the Department of Labor Statistics on Friday, which showed wages growing at their fastest pace in eight years, contributed to fear of inflation. This, in turn, sparked speculation that the Federal Reserve would soon be raising interest rates. This potential rise in interest rates may cause many corporations to worry about their profits after enjoying nearly a decade of the lowest global interest rates since World War II. SpaceX, founded by Elon Musk, successfully launched the world's most powerful rocket on Tuesday. The 27-engine Falcon Heavy launched from the Kennedy Space Center, carrying a Tesla sports car. The rocket will pass by Mars and eventually orbit around the Sun. SpaceX also managed to guide two of the Falcon Heavy's rocket boosters to land upright back to Earth, although a third booster crashed into the sea. Hi, I'm Flor Castillo, and this is Tell It Like It Is. On Friday, January 19th, Congress failed to pass legislation to fund government operations and agencies, disagreeing on major points such as building a border wall, military, DACA, and the Children's Health Insurance Program. President Trump and members of Congress have gone back and forth on proposed immigration reforms. Recently, President Trump put forward a plan to provide protection for DACA recipients, while also proposing changes to the legal immigration system and funding for a border wall. I sat down with Julieta Rendo Mendoza to discuss how immigration reform ties into the effort to fund the government these past few months. The changes that need to be made to the immigration system need to be radical and they need to provide solutions for all 11 million undocumented immigrants. Currently there are some people, um, some activists on the grounds in DC, but there's also localized actions in different parts of the nation. So chain migration, that's what they call it in the media, is really just family reun reunification. You know, this affects people. If you're trying to have families stay in the United States, you need to you need to create a pathway for them to sponsor their kids, for them to sponsor their parents, for them to sponsor their grandparents, so families can stay together. Democrats have held out on funding proposals due to seeking protection for dreamers. Last Wednesday, Nancy Pelosi spoke for eight hours on the House floor, claiming that the Democrats will not have a vote on the bill until they deal with immigration reform. I sat down with Elliot Fratkin, a member of the Massachusetts Democratic Committee, to explain more about the Democrats' position on these immigration and budget issues. 650,000, up to 800,000 of these dreamers in the country, and I think the Republicans fear uh, if they become citizens or have pathway to citizenship, uh, they'll end up in the Democratic Party and, and hurt their chances. So Trump, as you know, ran his election um, based on in, in, what I would call xenophobia, uh, fear of foreigners, particularly from Mexico. And this was appealing to the base that voted for Trump. It's the very right wing of the Republican Party. Many of them working people who fear they're losing jobs uh, to, to Mexicans and, and Ill, what they call illegals. Um, and in fact, they're not. But that was the fear that Trump ran on. And sadly, he won on that. At the time of filming on Thursday, February 8th, Congress was working on yet another six-week spending proposal to avoid another government shutdown. However, yet again, this spending proposal does nothing to address the issue of youth protected under the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program. I'm Flor Castillo, and this was Tell It Like It Is. Hi, I'm Lulu. Welcome to Hamped Up.
Yesterday kicked off the official start of the 2018 Winter Olympics. Instead of spending your life savings flying out to South Korea to watch the skiers in action, I decided to give you an inside look at one of NHS's tiniest but mightiest sports teams, the ski team. The sport is unique due to its demand for individual skill but also team chemistry. I sat down with senior captain Cody Guild and sophomore Anslin Jewett to discuss their experiences playing in some of the coldest conditions. Well, we try to maintain a good atmosphere by uh, promoting um, talking to each other and helping each other out when skiing. And also we just spend lots of time together so we end up becoming pretty good friends. So we stay motivated uh, by having a very good air of competition um, between the teams. Everyone's pretty happy about it and likes to race. Um, also, just everyone on the team is really fun to be around and it's nice to go out and ski with them for a day. Well, I think it helps that we have a really small team. I mean, it's unfortunate that we only have like three girls, but since we take the bus like every day to races and practice, like we like get close that way and we help each other. Like we bring our jackets up from the top. We pull courses together. We do a lot of things together, even though we race individually and we like cheer each other on a lot. Well, the goals for the end of the season are both individual and for the team. Uh, each individual person is trying to get the best course they can and people in the higher uh, seats are trying to get into states, which is top 32 people in the in our league, um, and the team generally just wants to stay in pretty high standings for the rest of the season. The girls' basketball team has a home game tonight against Central High School at seven. The girls and boys' track team has Western Mass Championships tonight at Smith College at six. Thanks for watching Hamped Up. I'm Lulu Kesson. Hi, I'm Ojap Bennis, and welcome back to Hit It or Miss It where all things pop culture are covered. When you hear the term blackface, what do you think? Do you think of a black person, or do you think of a white person mocking black people? Blackface, as well as brownface, yellowface, and redface are all forms of theatrical makeup used by actors who are not of that race or ethnic group they are mocking. Blackface can be seen in major cinematic movies from the early 1900s, such as Birth of a Nation, that portray black men as rapists. But what does blackface look like now? To get a better perspective of what blackface is and how it has evolved today, we sat down with Paulina Page, a lecturer at the Department of Theater in UMass Amherst, to understand the history of blackface. It really is the um, donning of black makeup, putting black makeup on to someone's face. Um, and it's a, a very old tradition, so it um, really got started in the 1830s, in about the 1830s in the United States. It's a tradition that really comes from uh, white people, say people who lived on plantations, people who owned slaves, and they would make observations about black people and they um, wanted to mock what they were seeing. So they created distortions and exaggerations and really the root of a lot of stereotypes about black people come from those early representations. Trenda Lofton is a youth engagement and arts interrogation specialist and on the board of directors for the Massachusetts Gay, Lesbian and Straight Education Network. We had the pleasure to sit down with Trenda and have her talk with us about the impact and significance of blackface and how it continues to affect people today. While at one point blackface was really about the paint, right, and the, the exaggeration of character um, that folks were doing, we're still seeing that exaggeration of character. We're still seeing the trying on of blackness, of black culture. Um, one example I can think of is the, the Catch Me Outside person, you know, who's like a young white girl who, you know, did that and went viral, right? And so part of that is this, um, not to say that that is the only way that blackness shows up is through the way people use words, right? Because black folks come <laughs> in a full range of ways of being. Um, but that is to say that, that there are certain ways of being that ha have been attached to and do exist in black communities. There are tropes, there are 
characters and characteristics that we see just repeated over and over and over again without much depth. Um, I do think we are finally getting <laughs> some, some real characters um, and some real character developments from, from black actors um, and writers. As media continues to increase its presence in our lives and new forms of theatrical experience emerge, it is important to keep historical trends such as blackface in our conversations. I'm Odette Bennis and this was Hit It or Miss It. Thanks for watching. Head over to nhstechnology.org to watch this week's online extras. Go Team USA! Yeah!